So it was widely understood that interviewing Britney isn't really, quote unquote, interviewing Britney. This is Andrew Hamp. He interviewed Britney for a Billboard cover story in 2015. She was about a year and a half into the Vegas residency at this point. And were people talking about her conservatorship and what was actually going on with her legally sort of behind the scenes? Was that a discussion that was going on? No, it wasn't an active part of the chatter in 2015 era, I would say. It's funny, right, in retrospect, I think because, you know, it's a, it's a testament to how good of a job the conservatorship did of putting the wall over all of our collective eyes, right? You know, that's why the, the discourse has shifted to the media being complicit in, in all of this, right? Because we, we absolved some of the things that we didn't choose to look into at the time. Andrews interviewed a lot of big names, J-Lo, Enrique Iglesias, Pink, and for all of them, he flew to a different city to sit down with the subject, usually for an hour or so at a time. He says an hour face-to-face is the minimum amount of time he needed to write a cover story about someone. Especially if the goal is to make the reader learn something they didn't already know about the person, that's virtually impossible to do over a phone interview without being able to design them the way you would face-to-face. But for Andrew's piece on Britney, Billboard let their usual conditions for a cover story slide, over the phone. I knew for sure that Larry Rudolph, her manager, would, would be on the line. So it struck Andrew as odd that he didn't know whether other members of the Britney Corporation were on the call with him and Britney. Andrew sent us a written transcript from this call. He kicks things off by complimenting Britney on her Vegas show. He asks her why she wanted to come to Vegas in the first place. She tells him she's excited to be in one place and not moving around while touring. I asked Brittany the seemingly innocuous question, what's your favorite song to perform during the residency? And she said, toxic, because I get showered on and it wakes me up. And then she laughed and, you know, she, I feel like I can give it my all, you know, and I think this is great. Okay, finally, I have something that's a little candid. Andrew thinks this detail is funny. Human. Brittany's show is 90 minutes of high octane stunts. Who wouldn't need a little reinvigoration halfway through? And then Larry calls me and basically said, could I remove that reference to being woken up? Could I reword it? Whatever it is. And of course, I had to say no. Like she said it on the record. I don't understand. It's not even that big of a deal. That was the only, frankly, nugget that I felt that we got (laughs) in the story itself. Why didn't Larry want the public to know about Brittany feeling woken up in the middle of her show? Was her team so focused on micromanaging her public persona that they thought this was a bad look? Or was this smoke and mirrors to cover something up? Like Brittany being overmedicated, as multiple friends and coworkers of hers have said they thought she was in this time. Looking back at the written transcript from this 15-minute interview now, years later, Andrew sees moments of real vulnerability from Brittany, moments that are evident, even in the way the call is written out. As I looked at the transcript again, there there are moments where I asked her about what advice would she have for 17-year-old Brittany, and all she said was, my advice would just be stay strong, and then silence, you see in brackets in in the transcript. So you could tell that there was a sadness that she was trying to communicate. Spy movie. She was always changing her phone number. She was positive that her communications were being surveilled. And people close to Britney have also told us that they believed they were bugged while talking to her. Lynn Spears has told the court that throughout the conservatorship, Jamie has exercised, quote, absolutely microscopic control over Britney and her actions. That Britney's household staff, medical aides, and security all reported Britney's every move back to Jamie. And friends of Britney's have told us that as Britney's boys grew older, Jamie continued to use them as a means of coercing her into compliance. We also know from materials provided to us that Britney had to hide even small purchases, such as buying an app on her phone. In 2014, she hid these transactions by using Bitcoin. Yes, that's right. Britney was using Bitcoin in 2014, way before the fuckboys on Reddit were talking about it. And there's one more thing we discovered in the course of our reporting about this time period. Britney wanted so badly to be free of this conservatorship that she was considering trying to escape the country. We've reviewed materials in which she discusses plans to obtain British citizenship. She dreamed of buying a country house outside London, where California probate laws would not apply to her. This is Britney in 2016 on a UK talk show hosted by comedian Jonathan Ross. Britney is there to discuss her residency and her new album, Glory. Most of the conversation is typical late-night banter about Britney's life in Vegas. But then, at one point in the interview, Britney reportedly says the C-word. Conservatorship. We've confirmed this with two different audience members who were there that day. One of them sent us a voice message describing what he saw. She did talk about the conservatorship, so I think the question was how Glory was different to other albums in the past. And she did say uh, that she had much more control of things during the recording of this album, I think she said exactly, uh, so I've been under a conservatorship and then hesitated a bit and being like, I was under a conservatorship, so she she didn't have much power in the past, but she said that she's gaining control little by little. And then it was just this very awkward silence in the whole like studio. Four days later, when the episode comes out, that portion of the interview doesn't air. Domination, the Las Vegas residency. So this is it, the announcement, a second Vegas residency. Fireworks ignite, dancers assemble, and then, Brittany slowly rises in the center of the stage, looking like she'd rather be literally anywhere else. She waves awkwardly and shifts her hands on and off of her hips. She looks around like she's waiting for something. Ladies and... Ladies! 
Ladies and gentlemen, Britney Spears! We're all expecting Britney to say something here. Thanks, guys. I'm so excited. Remind everybody when tickets go on sale. Even, hello! But there's nothing. Britney doesn't say a peep. After what feels like the world's longest 12 seconds, Britney walks down the stairs. She hits the red carpet and takes it all the way through the crowd. Then, still without saying anything, she just keeps walking and gets into a limo. And that's it. That's Britney's announcement. Remember how we told you in the last episode that Britney is currently on a work strike? Well, we're pretty sure that this was the beginning of that strike. This announcement fiasco is the last time Britney has appeared live before an audience. Because a few months later, she cancels the brand new residency altogether. And two and a half years after that, the smoke and mirrors era would end. The illusion would be broken by Britney herself. I just want my life back and it's been 13 years and it's enough. Next time on Toxic, we'll finally hear Britney, unfiltered. I should be in a conservatorship if I can work and provide money and work for myself and pay other people. It makes no sense, the laws need to change. is going to say, and we're happy that she's here today to address her concerns with the court. I would ask that we please seal the transcript and clear the courtroom so we can preserve those medical rights. I think it's really important. Here it is. One of the attorneys making the move we are expecting, asking to close the courtroom to the public. I'm thinking, great, now I'm going to have to leave with the rest of the reporters. So more stuff will happen behind closed doors. And, and it could be that she brings up issues related to her family and her minor children, and they have their own privacy rights, and I think anything said about them... They've done a good job at, at exploiting my, my life, so I feel like it, it should be an open court hearing, and they should um, listen and um, hear what I have to say. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Right now is not even the first time Brittany has told the judge about all this. She calls out the judge for her inaction over the last two years. I will be honest with you, I haven't been back to court in a long time because I don't think I was heard on any level when I came to court the last time. I'm telling you again, because I'm not lying. I want to feel heard and I'm telling you this again so maybe you can understand the depth and the degree and the damage that they did to me back then. After that 2019 testimony, which was closed to the public, Brittany didn't get what she wanted. Her dad didn't resign. The conservatorship didn't end. So here she is in court, making her case again. This time, it's an open hearing, accessible via audio on the court's video conference system. People across the world are listening in. And Brittany's not holding anything back. She tells the court exactly how she feels about her dad, Jamie, about how cruel he was in sending her to the treatment center against her will. I cried on the phone for an hour and he loved every minute of it. The control he had over someone as powerful as me to hurt his own daughter 100,000%, he loved it. Unpack the power dynamics surrounding Brittany and the veil of silence that's still wrapped around her story. I think we're still living in sort of the, the ruins of that structure of secrecy where, you know, there was an easy narrative presented for why this had to be the way that she was controlled. 